Welcome to another episode of Follow Your Path. My name is Abdul Abed, and today we will be talking to Dr. Jared Gardner. He is a dermatopathologist as well as a sarcoma pathologist at Geisinger Health in Danville, Pennsylvania. As usual, I am joined by my co-host, Meredith Herman. Welcome to the show, Dr. Gardner. Hey, thanks for having me. So starting off, uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, where you grew up, where you went to medical school? How did you end up in bone and soft tissue pathology? Uh, yeah, sure. The, I, was, uh, I was born in Ohio and central Ohio and grew up there. And then when I was a teenager, uh, my family moved to, to Florida near, near Pensacola. And so that's kind of home for me still. All my family's there. And then I kind of uh, migrated across the South going to undergrad and uh, in uh, Mobile, Alabama, and then uh, to medical school in New Orleans at Tulane University, which was a wonderful experience, except for that big hurricane, uh, Katrina, which happened when I was uh, right at the beginning of my fourth year. And so our house was flooded and, and the school had to move. And um, But that experience, uh, uh, I had actually planned on going to Houston anyway, because my, my wife's folks lived there. But um, uh, the experience got me there about a year early, which actually I, I didn't think about it until just now, actually, if it weren't for that, I don't know, I probably would have discovered soft tissue uh, pathology, but, um, but it was actually while I was rotating in Houston during that year, 2005, I think after Katrina, that I think it was the Houston Society of Clinical Pathology, they had, our clinical pathologists, they had the, um, had uh, uh, their annual meeting focused on soft tissue pathology, actually. And both uh, Chris Fletcher and Sharon Weiss and others were there. And I, I heard both of them speak and it was a, amazing lectures. They're both, you know, wonderful uh, lecturers. And uh, so that was really cool. And that was kind of, I think, an early seed planted. And then uh, I ended up staying at uh, Houston Methodist uh, for residency. And during that time, I got to see uh, a handful of cases of sarcoma and uh, working with mentors like Alberto Ayala and Jay Rowe, both of whom have a, well, they have an interest in like everything, but, but they particularly, uh, they, they did show me quite a few sarcomas and they were wonderful teachers. So I think I got kind of uh, more interest because of that. And then I ended up going and doing a month of uh, rotation with uh, Sharon Weiss um, at Emory in Atlanta. Um, and Dr. Ayala, I'm uh, forever thankful that he helped set that up and you know, he like emailed her and he's like, oh, Sharon, you know, I've got a, a young resident. Can he spend a month, you know, under your wing learning? And I was like, whoa, because she said, sure, Alberto. And I thought Dr. Ayala knows Dr. Weiss on a first name basis. It's so cool. And, uh, you know, I was kind of starstruck. And so so uh, working that month, I mean, the deal was it was done. I was like, if she'll if she'll have me, I want to be her fellow. And and I don't know, maybe she regretted that decision, but she took me and and uh, tolerated me pretty well for a year, I think so. She had to tell me to be quiet and shut up a few times, maybe because I talk a lot. But uh, but she was honestly, all joking aside, just such a a wonderful teacher and mentor, not just in the diagnostic part of pathology, but also kind of in like how to how to take consults and deal with difficult cases and how to be gracious to the people who send you stuff and how to word things in a way that's really clear. Which I still am. I am. I'll never be as good as she is at that. And uh, just a lot about like you know about how you're. To do how to do things professionally in your career and how to you know develop and grow as a pathologist and as a person, um, just an amazing mentor. So yeah, uh, I think uh, that's kind of my journey, um, I guess, in a nutshell. That sounds amazing, and you've had an incredible experience and got to meet so many awesome people and role models. And while we're on that topic, uh, we'd like to ask you: Is there a particular faculty member or mentor who inspired you along that that route to bone and soft tissue, or just in general along your path to pathology? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of a lot of mentors along the way, obviously, I mean, too many to name all of them, probably for fear I'd forget somebody. But uh, but I will say a few people that stand out. I mean, definitely, definitely Sharon. Um, Sharon Weiss made the, the huge impact as far as like training me and giving me the foundation of soft tissue pathology uh, and bone pathology knowledge that I that I have today. But also um, in earlier in training, uh, Jay Rowe and Alberto Ayala, who I mentioned a minute ago, I mean, really, they were both wonderful teachers. And, and particularly, I, I, I think Dr. Rowe stands out to me as the person that I credit with, with me becoming an, uh, an educator, uh, because he just, you know, he would do these one hour long sessions every day at the multi-headed scope, bring slides. And I mean, I tried to replicate that in my career and I, an hour every day, I just couldn't do it. I, I have a lot of energy, but I, I could not keep up with that. I don't know how he's done it all these years. 
and um and he just has this incredible style of teaching and uh uh really i think it was really that that i, I saw also that you know he he was still excited about and passionate about what he did and i think a part of that comes from the sharing of it of of knowledge even old you know boring routine knowledge that's every day for you and very, you know, vanilla and not exciting anymore. It becomes exciting when you share it with a junior person who's not learned it yet, I think. And so I felt like there was like a real sense of energy that he derived from that. And I was like, I want to do this, you know, uh, and be an educator. And so I, I really think that that really inspired me to become an academic and, and teaching type of pathologist. And, and other people too, you know, Ron Rapini is a, a dramatic pathologist, but also another person who I, I really like resonated with the way he taught and it was very funny. And, and uh, I thought I want to be like that. I, I don't think I'll ever achieve his level either, but, but I'll keep trying. And so, so those people I think maybe want to be an educator. And then uh, Sharon taught me a lot of the soft tissue. I know uh, Alberto Ayala taught me a lot also. And I also credit Mark Edgar, who I think, I think is not well known enough because he's not really a person who publishes a lot or gives a lot of talks, but he's such an incredible educator and, and he like reads the literature voraciously. And so he knows so much and is just incredibly diagnostic uh, skilled. Uh, pathologist, and, and he particularly has an interest in bone pathology, which to this day, I still find very challenging. I, I definitely find it, you know, probably even harder than soft tissue pathology in many ways. I mean, those specimens are more rare than soft tissue tumors. Um, and you often are, you know, have curated fragmented samples, and you really have to put it together with the radiology to make sense of it all. So in any case, though, um, uh, Mark was a faculty at, at uh, Emory at the same time uh, when I was there with Sharon. So he was my other my other educator uh, during my uh, fellowship there. And I uh, really just learned a lot of really great uh, things from him. And one is one of the things that really stood out to me as, as interesting um, is the, the way he would visually describe different things. And if you watch my videos online, you'll often find that I'll say, oh, they're, you know, that these are the splatter cells of a desmoplastic fibroblastoma. Mark taught me that, or he's the one who taught me that, you know, translocation sarcomas usually have uniform monotonous nuclei because they all have the same molecular problem, whereas aneuploidy is the kind of genetic abnormality that often gives rise to pleomorphism. And, and that's like, I remember the moment he said that it was like the heavens opened and there was a choir singing, you know, of angels or something. And I was like, this is so amazing. How did I not know this? And so Mark just had these really incredible little tips and tidbits and, and visual pearls that really resonated with my brain. You know, some of the stuff that the the uh, old forefathers of pathology said that, you know, that things look like don't really look that way to me, but the way Mark Edgar described things, I was like, that's exactly what it looks like. So I love that. And it also gave me a passion for like finding different ways to visually describe the things we see, recognizing that different people's brains resonate differently with different analogies. And like I always tell trainees, if, if you don't like the, you know, chicken wire or whatever the analogy is that that was given in days of yore, that's fine. Like learn it for testing purposes, but find the analogy that works for you, for your brain. And then I try to share all those with my trainees in hopes that one of them will stand out. So, so those are some people I think that inspired me along the way. And, and like, like I said, there's just been many others. So. Nice. Nice. That's, that's a wonderful journey. Uh, so Dr. Gardner, in your opinion, if you were talking to a medical student today, such as Meredith or a junior resident, what would you tell them? What makes bone and soft tissue unique compared to other parts of pathology? Well, I mean, I think a couple of things that really stand out are that, you you know, people often talk about how hard bone and soft tissue pathology is. And it is, but I mean, all of pathology is hard, but I, I've thought about that a lot. Why why is soft tissue pathology and bone pathology so hard? I think there are a few reasons, and, and this is part of what makes it unique. So that's why I'm, I'm not saying it to dissuade anyone, um, but uh, it was actually one of the reasons I kind of decided to go into it. I thought it was fascinating, but also it's all very rare and esoteric. And for whatever reason, and I've always liked things that are rare and unusual. And I've always had a, a brain that was kind of keyed in on stuff like that. So I feel like uh, soft tissue and bone was a natural fit because of, of my love for rare, weird things. And so I think that's part of what makes it challenging though, is the rarity. Um, you, you rarely encounter these, these lesions. They're not everyday lesions. And then 
um, especially if you don't have a pathologist focused on them at the place where you work or train. And if you don't have a surgeon focused on them, like an orthopedic oncologist who, you know, specializes in removing sarcomas and other tumors of bone and soft tissue. So I feel like if you don't have those kinds of doctors where you work, you will see them even less frequently. And it's hard to get good at something that you don't see very often, right? It's hard to get good at something that's rare. Also, if you don't have someone there to directly teach you and kind of teach you the nuance of it and how to do it. So I think that that's part of why it's challenging. And, and part of what makes it unique and interesting is that you get to see things that are rare. You get to do a specialty that, that many other pathologists don't have much familiarity with or struggle with. And so there are, there are a lot of pros, maybe, maybe cons. I don't know. It depends on how you think of it. I mean, that means sometimes you're doing things alone or, or with limited support, and that can be challenging. But, you know, like in my practice, at least if I have hard stuff, I still send it out to other experts to get their input on challenging things. That's part of how I continue to learn. I also have colleagues here in my department that also specialize in it. And so we look at cases together. But I think that that's also really exciting and fun to be able to see things and like that that are rare. And also, I mean, people from all sorts of different specialties, uh, subspecialties in pathology will bring you cases to see. Like I was just this morning looking at an unusual spindly proliferation in the colon with one of my GI pathology colleagues. Um, and so that you know, spindle cell things pop up in all sorts of different organ systems. So you'll end up getting to see kind of a wider range than you might imagine. And also I think it's interesting because there's a lot of molecular components to what we do. And I think that's gonna be, continue to grow. And I mean, that's true probably for all of pathology, but, but many soft tissue tumors are translocation based or have other genetic and molecular abnormalities that we can test for. And so I think it's a nice specialty if you're interested in the molecular aspect of things, you can incorporate that and, and you know, I, I personally use it, I use it practically, but I don't delve deeply into like the research level of molecular stuff or, you know, some people spend their whole career focused on the molecular aspect of soft tissue tumors. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, that's a nice niche angle to pursue for people that really have a deep love of molecular. I, I find it really complicated and confusing still. Uh, but so I've learned enough to use it practically in my practice, but the deeper knowledge I'll leave to, to wiser and smarter people than me. So I think those are, those are all some interesting things. Um, a lot of the, the tumors have a, a pretty, you know, a pretty significant impact on patients. I mean, the difference is a benign versus malignant um, for, you know, a spindle cell tumor um, is pretty drastic sometimes and results in either a major difference in surgery or treatment, you know, whether someone will get radiation or not, or chemotherapy or not, and uh, obviously huge prognostic differences. So there's a lot on the line and a lot at stake, and you have a lot that you can offer to patients. Um, and I think that there's something really satisfying about that. And I, I've had a chance to work with um, a, a variety of different soft tissue tumor patients online, uh, volunteering in Facebook patient support groups. So getting to see kind of the patient side of things. And it's been really, uh, really life-changing for me, honestly, to get a chance to, to do that. I, I gave a TED talk a couple of years ago about that. So anyone listening who's interested can just like look up my name and TED, TEDx on, on YouTube, and you'll find it on the TEDx channel. But uh, it's been a really cool experience. So those are some some things I think that make this specialty unique. Oh yeah, and the last thing is I think it's really fascinating to look at. There's so many different types of tumors, and they have such an unusual and interesting mixture of patterns. Um, and I find the patterns of soft tissue tumors to be really fascinating. So uh, to me, it visually resonates as well. All right, there's there's all the reasons that soft tissue is amazing and cool and and uh, unique. Thank you so much, Dr. Gardner, and and I'm sold too now. You've you've convinced awesome. me. <laughs> uh, so speaking of rare and unique and unusual and uh, cases that you've seen and you're in with your involvement in patient care groups, um, can you share an interesting case that you've seen in your career and how that's impacted you? Well, gosh, so many. Um, let me think of, uh, well, you know, one that comes to mind, I think, is um, is uh, a case that I saw. It was like a, a spine biopsy from like a vertebral lesion. And it had, you know, atypical spindle cells with a bunch of eosinophilic cytoplasm. And I looked around a little bit and some were kind of a little bit fibrillary cytoplasm. And then I started seeing cross striations. And I was like, this is a rhabdomyosarcoma. This was an adult patient. And the person who had, had sent the case to me said, well, the, the uh, patient has a history of melanoma. And I was like, what? Some, something has 
something's wrong here. Someone made a mistake or something. So I spent a bunch of time tracking down the, the outside previous specimen, which was from a different laboratory, and finally put together the story that actually they did have a melanoma, just a regular old you know melanoma. It wasn't even a particularly thick one, honestly. And then that melanoma metastasized to a, an axillary lymph node and was a big bulky metastasis and had big zones where it had lost expression of its melanoma markers. S100 and SOX10 were, had big areas that were negative. And those areas of the tumor actually had expression of Desmond, and but no other markers like myogenin and myoD1, rab, which are you know skeletal muscle rhabdomyosarcoma markers, were negative. And then the next step was a while later they developed a spine metastasis, and that tumor had Desmond and myogenin, and had a little bit of I can't remember if it was MART1 or HMB, a little bit of melanocytic markers. So basically the idea was, and then the patient unfortunately passed away um, not too long later. They ended up getting distant mets to the kidney and some other places too, but. Um, what it basically had happened is that the melanoma de-differentiated and lost its, you know, melanocyticness, so mm -hmm. to speak. I don't know if that's a word, but I just made it one. And then kind of re-differentiated or had heterologous differentiation into rhabdomyosarcoma. So that case was really fascinating for me, very sad for the patient, but really fascinating, both from a diagnostic perspective to try to figure out like what is going on here and how does this all make sense? And so we were finally able to piece that together. And then from a, a deeper, like, um, you know, molecular or, or bio, biological aspect to, to wonder, you know, this is so weird how sometimes tumors de-differentiate and then can have heterologous differentiation along different lines. And we see that in, in, in sarcomas, like malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors often do that. But I thought it was really interesting here that there's this crossover between melanoma and sarcoma. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we see also carcinoma sometimes do that, right? Have carcinosarcoma with heterologous differentiation. I mean, uh, if you're a new person to pathology, this is all very esoteric stuff. But, but what's amazing to me is I've seen that happen before in various ways with carcinomas. I've seen it happen with malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors and other sarcomas. But melanoma is extremely unusual to see that happen. Um, and particularly, I wondered why that was because... Malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor often has rhabdomyosarcoma differentiation, what we call malignant triton tumor is the fancy mm -hmm. name for that. And malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor is from uh, Schwann cells, uh, neural crest origin embryologically. Well, melanoma comes from melanocytes, which are also neural crest. Mm -hmm. And so I was su surprised, why is it that malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor often turns into rhabdomyosarcoma discomponent, but melanoma, which is like a thousand times more common than malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor, and is also from the neural crest, why does it not do that more often? Mm -hmm. And I don't know the answer to that, but I thought it, it just, I've still pondered that case. We ended up publishing that it's, uh, if you look my name up and heterologous rhabdomyosarcoma, melanoma, Google will find that for you. It was a couple of years ago we published that. But I, I found cases like that where there's this crossover are really fascinating. So that's one that particularly stood out to me, especially since I do derm path and bone and soft tissue. That was a nice overlap uh, between those fields. And I, I mean, I think there's a great overlap actually between derm path and soft tissue because a lot of soft tissue tumors occur in the skin. Mm -hmm. Melanocytic tumors can have a lot of features similar to, to sarcoma sometimes. And, uh, and so there's a, a, nice, uh, a nice matching of those two fields, I think. So that was an interesting case. Yeah, I mean, uh, your passion for your job is, is we could just sense it in your voice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, you got to love what you do, right? I yeah, mean, well, yeah, I guess absolutely. you don't have to, but yeah. I, it's a lot more enjoyable <laughs> if you do. Yeah. Um, so, I was I was rotating somewhere a long, long time ago, and one of the faculty had said, uh, um, you really like looking at slides. And I was like, yeah, I mean, come on. <laughs> and uh, I, I guess I realized that maybe this is just a, a job for some people, but I think most pathologists I know are pretty excited about the work that yeah. we do. So, so uh, yeah, nice hopping onto that bandwagon, what is the most gratifying aspect of your job? Well, um, you know, uh, years ago when I was a, a teenager, I worked in a pathology lab and um, and I uh, had the chance to work with a pathologist. It was a private practice lab in Pensacola, Florida. And the pathologist's name was, was Dr. Nora. And only years later, after I became a bone and soft tissue pathologist, that I realized it was the Nora who described Nora's lesion, bizarre mm -hmm. parosteal osteochondromatous proliferation. That's why they call it Nora's lesion, right? Because that name is too long. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> it was really great to know him before I knew that he was famous and had a, a, an entity named after him. He was just this really like uh, excited, enthusiastic guy and uh, really nice to me as a, a you know, a a high school student interested in pursuing uh, medicine and, and, and interested in pursuing pathology. And I asked him one day if he liked his job and he said, Jared, I come to work and I have fun and I get paid for it. 
And I thought that's a perfect example of what's awesome about, about pathology. And of course, I'll add to that, that the, the ability to do something that you enjoy, that you can provide for your family with and, and to live a, a good lifestyle. And at the same time, help people who are sick, you know, and guide the, the patient care that people, particularly cancer patients receive. I think that's like, I mean, it's a perfect combination, right? You get to do something that's meaningful and helps other people is intellectually satisfying and enjoyable to do. And, and it provides a good living uh, for you. So I feel like to me that that kind of sums up what we do. I think the other aspect of, of all of pathology is that in general, it's a pretty flexible field. So as far as having a family, you know, I know that people have this impression pathologists don't work. You know, we just, you know, are on the golf course at two o'clock in the afternoon or something. And I'm like, man, I don't know what I did wrong in my career, but that's not how my job has panned out. I, I usually work pretty decent amount of hours, probably more than I should. And that's probably partially because I overcommit myself and you know, internal personal problems I have that I need to, you know, say no to more things maybe. But in any case, uh, my wife's a psychiatrist. I'll let her try to fix that. But, <laughs> but the point is we, we do work hard a lot of times, but we have some flexibility in the way our days are structured. And, you know, when you have kids and you need to take them to a doctor's appointment or something, a lot of times I can take time off in the middle of the day in a way that colleagues that are seeing patients in clinic or have an operating room schedule uh, wouldn't be able to as easily do. So I love that there is that flexibility in my schedule. I can go home and spend some time with my family. If I need, I can come back later at night or earlier the next morning to you know get caught up on cases or things I need to do. So I really like that aspect of things. And uh, I think that's a nice, a nice bonus part of being a pathologist. Nice. There's a lot of perks of being a pathologist yeah, and absolutely. you just listed a whole bunch of them. So it's, it's a wonderful career and you can have a lot of fun at it too. So shifting gears a little bit, um, can you explain to us what the training is like for the subspecialty and you know what it's like with fellowship and if there's board exams, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, so I think soft tissue pathology is a little bit different than some of the other fellowships. I mean, as a, a relatively esoteric and small field, there are not nearly as many training programs um, that are focused exclusively on a, a bone or soft tissue fellowship. There is a, a list of them. I actually have a a pathology resident wiki that I made when I was a, a resident um, with the goal of listing all the different fellowships and residency programs that are out there. And uh, I did that when I was supposed to be studying for boards. I, I've gotten some of my best work done when I'm procrastinating from things that are less enjoyable uh, to do. So in any case, um, that's out there. And so that the um, the uh, there's not a large number, but there's also not a large number of people that are going into that field, right? There are many people interested in it, but people that are willing to take a whole year and just focus on training and that there's not nearly as many. Hmm. So I think... Um, I think you have to, you know, look at the different programs and and find which one works for you. I think the things that matter the most are the people you train with, the, the kind of specimens that you'll get in the program and who you're training with. You know, I um, mean, you spend a lot of time with usually, you know, one or a small number of, of faculty, um, often that are well regarded in their field. And you really learn a lot about the way they do things. And I think that's a, a really cool part of it. Um, and then, you um, uh, there's no board examination for it. It is kind of an experience year, basically. You know, you go and spend time looking at a bunch of those cases with someone who knows how to do it. And after that, when people hire you, they know like, oh yes, you have uh, training in that specialty. So uh, in soft tissue pathology or bone pathology, there are, I think there is like one program maybe in New York that I can't remember if it's, yes, you have to look on that page, but that, that focuses mostly on bone pathology, actually, mm. which is kind of a, you know, there are overlaps with soft tissue, but it does have some very unique aspects of bone pathology. Yeah. So I think that, you know, uh, that's, that's what the training's like. The, like I said, no board uh, um, beyond your regular pathology boards. Uh, I think for people who don't want to do a whole year of fellowship, you, I do know people who do soft tissue pathology in practice, but did not do an entire fellowship. If you have an interest in it and spend time learning about it, and maybe do, you know, in a way rotation or something for a month or a few months, ideally. I mean, that's enough that people that work around you will show you all their soft tissue cases, because again, many people find it challenging and don't have a lot of experience with it. So when they know you have an interest in it, even guess what, you're going to get more soft tissue cases and your, your knowledge will continue to grow. That was part of my decision to do a fellowship as I thought, I want to get good at this and I want to be able to see more. And if I do training, I'll be better at it. And then more people will show me their cases and then I'll get continually better at it. Although eventually that spiraled out of control and I started getting way more cases than I could even, you know, uh, handle. 
and I, I've had to try to kind of step back. I, I used to take consults and I've actually tried to stop uh, when I changed jobs a couple of years ago. I said, I don't want to take consults anymore. Not because I didn't enjoy doing it, but, but I like getting home and seeing my family. And I have more than enough interesting and difficult cases just in my own department to, mm. to handle. So mm. um, I, I've tried to not add more, uh, more on top of that. I'll leave that for the real experts to, to handle. But um, yeah, so I think that the along the way, though, how to get into that fellowship, I think it it's not super competitive because there's not a lot of people, but it is important to, to if you can do some, a rotation with at least, you know, one uh, person, if you're able to do an away rotation, at, ideally at the center where you're interested in, in going for fellowship, that, that would be really helpful. If you can't do that because of, you know, departmental restrictions, that's okay. You know, you still can do things, try to publish some stuff that's about, that's related to soft tissue pathology. And that's, you know, you can usually find that because it overlaps with other fields like derm path or, you know, other things. And so you can find some kind of crossover uh, case reports or, you know, or, uh, or uh, research projects that you can do maybe that have an overlap with an other field, but being able to do uh, an, a rotation, at least a short one, uh, can be very helpful in kind of opening the door to, to get you into a fellowship, I think. And there's now, you know, this didn't exist when I was a trainee, but there's lots of online resources. I have tons of videos on my YouTube channel, my Kiko um, uh, page uh, that, that are uh, soft tissue focused. So there's a lot of online learning opportunities, and you can use that to build your skills and to continue to show your interest along the way. And I think that'll help open some doors for you. Uh, as well. And of course, use Twitter to reach out and follow. There are a lot of soft tissue pathologists who are on Twitter, and it's a great way to interact with them and to, you know, directly talk to them about your interest. And in doing that, you'll learn about how to get into the field. And they'll also be like, oh, who's this young rising star who wants to do soft tissue pathology? You know, uh, that kind of stuff stands out. So, so those are some ways you can open doors for yourself and, and kind of pave the way for your career. Oh, nice. I, I was going to ask, that was going to be my last question. Like, what advice do you have for residents interested in patho uh, BSD pathology? And you already answered that. So, yeah. And I mean, <laughs> that goes for kind of any subspecialty. I mean, obviously, I know social media is kind of my thing, but I it's my thing because it's really useful and powerful. I mean, it's fun too, but, but there's a lot of open doors you can get from using Twitter and interacting with other people in your field of interest, right? So they get to know your name and recognize your name. You can learn from them, both diagnostic knowledge and, you know, career knowledge and practice knowledge and, and how to pursue, you know, your subspecialty. And I think those are all great things. And you can use social media to, to help educate, you know, even if you're a junior person, there's stuff, you know, that other people don't, and you can share that. And that always, I think to me as an educator, that looks good when I see junior people who are using their spare time to further educate other people. I, I like that because that resonates with the way I think about things. So um, all those things will, you know, kind of you know, open doors for you, I think. And, and then once you meet people, then the people kind of do the rest and, you know, you know, the open door is just part of it. You got to hustle and do hard work and read and learn and, and, you know, write some papers, you know, as great as Twitter is, it doesn't replace all that other stuff, but it can open the doors at an earlier stage. And then you can, it gives you a chance to shine and show that you're, you know, you're, you know, a hard worker, you're smart, you want to make a difference. And I think that's the kind of stuff that uh, fellowship directors are looking for. So, um, you know, you, you know, that'll people give you a chance and then you can show them that, that their chance was a good one and that you're going to, you're going to make it, uh, make it count. So, yeah. so there you go, guys, young, junior, BST, future pathologists go out there and, <laughs> and, you know, conquer and, you know, I'll see you on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, uh, before we end, I just want to share an anecdote. I was doing my OSLA review before my boards and uh, in the molecular part, the guy was talking about, I forget the, the name of the instructor, but he was talking about Gardner syndrome and he showed your photo as like a visual cue. <laughs> and I will never forget that. Yeah, I mean, it's, I don't know Dr. Gardner who described Gardner syndrome and, and to my knowledge, no relation. Uh, like my uh, great, great, grandfather or maybe one more great was adopted um way back in the olden days by someone named Gardner so Gardner actually only goes back a few generations in my family line and to my knowledge I'm the first medical doctor in my in my family uh but I I would say Dr. Gardner took the chance for me to get an F in him so <laughs> I can't have a, any syndrome named after me I guess I could use, you know do something like Gardner triad I could try yeah. something like that so <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've published some papers. I'm still waiting for the Nobel committee to call me, but, but I'll settle for an F and M if we can, but I just can't have Gardner syndrome because it's already taken. So. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Gardner. So right, that's our, Thanks that's our show folks. Uh, you can find Dr. Gardner on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and Kiko. His Twitter handle is at JM Gardner, G A R D N E R M D. Thank you very much for listening to us. And we'll be back for another episode soon. All right.
right, I'll stop recording here. And feel free to cut out any parts that you need to if 